Hey guys, today we're going to learn the basics of capacitors. Uh, this is especially for the benefit of those of you who may have missed this material due to, say, being on a Kairos retreat or something. Um, so here you go, basics of capacitors. First thing is, what is a capacitor? All right, so the uh, circuit diagram drawing for them kind of looks like what a capacitor basically is. It's two parallel plates, and then these things right here would be your wires that connect to, say, the rest of the circuit. All right, so then this, this could be a capacitor. This one happens to be adjustable, where I can, say, move the plates to a different separation apart from each other. All right, but fine. Most capacitors don't actually look like that, but that's where all of the math that we're going to do is going to come from, is from thinking about that picture right there as being our capacitor. All right, now, what do they really look like? Most of the time, if you open up a circuit board, these are grossly exaggerated ones, but look something like this. This is a huge capacitor. Okay, If you actually open up most electronics these days, they're going to be way, way, way tinier than that. Um, this one even is a bit large. Okay, so... Um, whatever. They come in all different sizes and shapes, right? The ones that I showed you right there are what are called electrolytic capacitors. They all have about that shape, um, so some kind of a cylinder thing, right? Um, but essentially it all boils down to the parallel plate capacitor, right? So the basic equations for them I've drawn here on the board, okay? So make sure that you, uh, wherever you're taking notes for this, Write them all down in one place. I find it's helpful, especially with capacitors, to have all those equations in one place because the problems with capacitors are approximately plug and chug. Like, there's really not a whole lot to do with them besides, all right, they give you the numbers, you put the numbers in the right place. If you're putting the numbers in the right places, as long as everything's in the right units, you should get correct answers out of it. So, all things considered, it's really not that complicated of a process, but having all the equations in one place is really going to help you to see maybe the easiest way to get from point A to point B, calculationally speaking. Uh, all right, so the um, equations that we have up here, uh, oh, excuse me, I, I guess I forgot to talk about what are they for, uh, because probably you're a little bit curious about that. So, the fundamental uh, purpose of a capacitor, usually anyway, is to either main purposes, maintain a voltage. So you want the volts to be a particular value somewhere in your circuit. We'll talk later when we do more about circuits why you would want a particular voltage value somewhere. Um, or the other purpose is to provide a quick jolt of electricity. Uh, that would be, for example, if you're trying to get a motor started. So as an additional example, this one right here is a capacitor. It doesn't work anymore, but it's a broken one from out of an air conditioning unit. When you want to start up an air conditioner, you need a very sudden and enormous jolt of electricity to get it going. So this one is a 2,300 volt capacitor. Well, that sounds terrifying. Okay, so that's how many volts you'll have uh, going from one plate to the other in this thing. That's a lot of volts, and the reason that you have that much on there is so that you can provide a very powerful jolt of electricity to get the compressor and the fan motor and everything else in the air conditioner going. All right, fine. So the equations for it. Um, we have this one, which relates capacitance, charge, and potential difference, or volts. Um, so if this is your picture of a capacitor, if this is hooked up to a battery, one plate of your capacitor will be positive. The other plate will be negative. The total charge on a capacitor is actually technically always zero, but whenever we say the charge on the capacitor, what we mean is the magnitude of the charge on each plate. Okay, so the charge on the capacitor would be really just the charge of one plate, ignoring the signs. All right, 
So capacitance is measured in farads, and according to this equation right here, a farad is a coulomb per volt. By the way, feel free to pause the video whenever you need to, say, write something down and I'm going too fast, all right? Definitely take notes periodically, which is going to mean pausing me, okay? All right, so a, a farad, abbreviated with an F, is a coulomb per volt. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if you have a, let's say, a one microfarad capacitor, then that means that it stores one micro coulomb of charge per volt that you put onto it. All right. If you had a one farad capacitor, it would store a coulomb of charge on each plate per volt that you put on it. A farad of capacitance is enormous. All right. So of the various capacitors I picked up, this one's a 4,700 micro farad capacitor. Okay, all right. This one was just a, uh, a uh, 0.47 micro farad capacitor. But I don't want you to think that it's necessarily size that determines the capacitance, because it's, it's not exactly, okay? Um, if I pick up, oh, this one right here, which is in between, I don't know, hang on, <laughs> somewhere. Oh, here we go, my favorite. This one is a one farad capacitor. All right, so in a little bit we'll talk about how do they fit all that capacitance into this tiny little space. Because, yeah, right? Uh, it's not physical size of the object necessarily that determines the capacitance. There is more to it, which is going to bring us to our next equation. Okay, so we said this is charge, this is volts, this is capacitance. All right, uh, by the way, please don't get confused about the fact that the letter C in an equation is capacitance, whereas Coulomb's is abbreviated with also the letter C. All right, so C is not for charge. It hasn't been for a while. Okay, Q is for charge. C is for capacitance. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, in this equation right here, we have... Uh, kappa, not K, guys, it's kappa. All right, not to be confused with the letter K, especially because um, K is 9 times 10 to the 9th, Coulomb's constant, as you may recall, which is definitely not the same as kappa in this equation right here. Kappa stands for what's called the dielectric constant. The dielectric constants can be found on page 791 in your textbook, I believe. Um, all right, so, but most of the time, if it's a number you need, I'm probably going to give it to you, okay? So, on a test or something like that. On the other hand, on the homework, they'll make you look it up, and I believe all that's on page 791. If I get the page number slightly wrong, excuse me, it's definitely in the chapter on capacitance. All right. This is the vacuum permittivity, as you may recall, or permittivity of free space, which is a constant equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. It is a tiny, tiny little number, which is part of the reason why most capacitances are going to be so small. All right, the A, um, if you recall, the picture of the capacitor was parallel plates. The A is the surface area of the plates. Uh, it's really, it's the surface area of just one plate, okay? So don't double it because there's two plates. It's the surface area of a plate. Uh, although, um, to be super technical, it's the area of overlap between the two plates. So if I've got two plates like this that overlap perfectly, right? Great, so there we have it. The area would be whatever the area of my hand is, because that's my plate. All right, but on the other hand, if I'm like this, the area would be zero. This is not a capacitor if they don't actually overlap. Uh, and it would be whatever this area that they have in common is uh, in, in the case where they're kind of tilted like this. I'm not gonna give you anything stupid like that. They're gonna be perfectly aligned, but Please no, don't double it because there's two plates, all right? Uh, and then D, oh, sorry, measured in square meters. 
they will frequently give you stupid units. So when I do an example later on in this video, I will give you stupid units and then you'll have to convert them. Uh, the D there is the plate separation. That's how far apart they are and that is measured in meters, as you might imagine, because it is a distance. Okay, so for this equation then, you would be plugging in your various values, okay, and then it's plug and chug, right? That, that's all that's going on there. Same thing for the other equation that relates those three things to each other. You're going to know two out of the three. If you don't know two out of the three, then either you're reading the question wrong or you can't use that equation and you're supposed to use something else on the list. Okay, moving down. E is for electric field. You had better believe that there is an electric field between the plates, all right? If your plates are charged, oppositely charged, well, there's going to be a very strong electric field pointing from the plus to the minus because fields leave positives and go in towards negatives. So the magnitude of the electric field is based on the charge on the plates, the dielectric constant, epsilon naught, and the surface area of the plates, if this is the equation you're consulting. Um, for those of you in honors, the sigma here, that's, if you recall, surface charge density. That's the ratio of charge to area. There's a couple of questions in the homework where they're going to ask for the surface charge density and not the, the charge or the area separately. Okay, um, the dielectric constant, by the way, I should have said a little while ago when we were up here, the, the, the dielectric constant is usually going to be a smallish number, like let's say 5. Okay, so smallish numbers. Uh, it's never going to be something as large as 9 times 10 to the 9th, which is why I emphasize that, it, that kappa is not k Coulomb's constant. All right, they are definitely different numbers. All right, this equation. Uh, we already know what all these things are. Electric field, electric potential, and plate separation. So this is a nice, easy equation that I like a lot because it's a simple way of relating those things. Uh, whereas this is not my favorite equation to use if I can get away with it. All right, and then finally, potential energy. Sometimes capacitors are used really for the purpose of storing energy, right? That's another way of looking at the quick jolt that they give things. Um, the potential energy stored on a capacitor follows any one of these three equations. Where they come from, meaning the different forms, is based on this right here. Where this one comes from in the first place is actually derived from calculus, and I'm not going to do that. Um, but you can imagine that if I take this equation up here and I solve it for Q, Q is C delta V. So then if I replaced Q with C delta V, it would give me this equation right there. And then the other one is derived also from a similar substitution. Okay, so... What is there left to do with this? Well, so in your homework, you're going to be given a variety of questions on capacitors where they give you some numbers and then you're supposed to plug in the numbers into the appropriate equation to solve for something. So what we're going to do uh, in the next like minute and a half of this video is I'm going to give you a problem uh, and then you're going to pause the video and work it out. Okay, so give me a moment to set that up. But here's your scenario. We've got two square plates, whatever, it doesn't matter, um, with a plate separation of eight centimeters, careful there, a surface area of 64 square centimeters, keep being careful, hooked up to a 12 volt battery. Okay, so part A, you're going to find the capacitance in the event that it's just air between the plates. B, it's going to be filled with polystyrene then you'll find the charge, then you'll find the electric field. So, as I've frequently done with examples, I'm going to let you set it up. You pause the video, and then resume when you think you've got it, okay? And then math shall appear on the screen, and hopefully uh, you got it right. So here we go. All right, please excuse any inaccuracies in my calculations. That's not the point of the video, right? If we've set up the math correctly, then we're good. Converting square units is annoying. Remember, you have to do it twice. Okay, and everything had to be converted. All right, pause again, try the next part. We did it. 
Right? Now part C. There you go. All right, and then the last part. There we have it. Okay, great. Thanks for watching.